Please join me in prayer. In gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks that you enter our lives in so many ways. We're thankful that you enter our lives speaking your word, that word that is revealed in scripture, that word which we're about to hear. And so we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to enlighten that word so that it may come alive in our hearing, that we may, may feel touched and moved to greater discipleship. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the living word. Amen. Listen now to scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a, of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded, said to one another, and who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it's impossible. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in the age. Houses, brothers, and sisters mothers and children, and fields with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I just was wondering as I was reading, who turned on the light? <laughs> I believe it was God. <laughs> A while back, I was having a conversation with a colleague who was about my age, right? two, two years younger, really. We were talking about our post-ministry plans, retirement, you know, what they would include, traveling, fishing, hobbies, and you know, actually sitting in worship with our spouses and our family at times. And in the course of the conversation, he said, just think. I only have three more stewardship drives until retirement. <laughs> the comment struck me as funny, and I gave it a good laugh. But it was also revealing about my profession. It revealed a good deal about how we clergy feel about the matter of money and the funding of our churches. Now think about it, why are women and men called into ministry? I've served on committees that examine young candidates for ministry. And, you know, you know, when they've been asked, you know, why do you feel you are called to become a minister? And that's often asked of them. In fact, it always is. I have never heard one candidate say, well, the reason why I want to be a minister is because I want to conduct stewardship campaigns. I have never heard that. No. We're called to this profession because we want to care. We want to teach, we want to pray, we want to study, we want to preach. We want to lead people in their spiritual lives. 
And the damnable thing about ministry is that in order to do all that, to do those things we're called by God to do, preach, heal, teach, care, pray, preach, we also have to honor the hunger of the institution for financial resources. It's the bane of our profession. And the few who do seem to thrive at it, you know, end up becoming professional fundraisers. They leave the ministry. Well, people in the pew, you, are also familiar with the annual October drill, aren't you? You know, there are the standard stewardship texts, and you know them. There's the one Jeremiah purchases the field from those middle chapters of Jeremiah. There's the story of the widow's might. And then, of course, the one I read to you today, the rich young man. You know, all of those, when you hear them in October, early November, you know, uh-oh, here it comes. Don't make eye contact with the pastor. <laughs> You have a way of saying, you know, bracing yourself and saying, well, this is the stewardship sermon. You know, one more of these and we'll get on. The commitment card must be in the mail. I hope you have received it by now. Uh, and if you've already lost it, which we know happens, you can go online and actually, you know, make your gift that way, your pledge that way. And so when you heard the scripture lesson as I read it to you today, as you looked in the bulletin and saw the title, you, know, you said, uh-oh, here it comes. Get ready. Well, here's my question. And it's a question that's born of 40 plus years of doing this. Do stewardship sermons actually make any difference? I mean that seriously. You know, I realize that I'm, you know, really uh, committing pastoral heresy at this point, but I'm not sure if there is any relationship between the stewardship sermon, no matter how good or how bad, and the amount that is committed during the stewardship campaign. You know, I can count probably on one hand uh, the number of people that have come up to me after a stewardship sermon and said something beside, oh, that was nice, or we needed to hear it. You know, what I'm looking for is, you know, I changed my pledge because of what you heard. Doesn't happen. Now think about it here at Poland Presbyterian Church. You know, we've raised a large sum of money recently for, for the capital needs here. You know, and you have been very generous, and I'm going to say thank you for that generosity. And as we anticipate the annual stewardship campaign that will follow in the the next few weeks, I want to re-examine the topic of stewardship in light of the biblical story that I just read. And I've got three points I'm going to make, so you can kind of time when you know I'm getting to the end. <laughs> first, my first point is this, we do it wrong, so I'm going to repent, okay? The second one is, how much we give is not what matters, okay? I saw a couple of sighs of relief there. And the third one is, it's a matter of life and death. It really is. Now, do I have your attention? Let's go. We do it wrong. I think the church and religious institutions, and for that matter, secular uh, you know, charities, do a very fine job of raising funds in our society. Of the total amount that's given to charities, you know, churches and religious organizations continue to receive the largest percentage. I think it's you know, between 35 and 40% of all charitable giving in this country goes to religious institutions. It used to be around 55 and even higher than that. Americans also tend to be very generous in comparison to other countries, although that amount is now decreasing. We do a good, reasonably good job of raising funds. But merely raising funds for an organization is not the stewardship that Christ taught. You see, I fear that the way we are approaching stewardship has made us one more eleemosynary institution asking for donations to support it. You know, we know the list. There's the YMCA, the hospital, the Red Cross, our university or college, public broadcasting. And I will say, every one of those you know, institutions is worthy of our support. My family supports them. They're worthy of our contributions because they make our lives better. My concern is, are we, members of the church, one more fundraising organization out there attempting to get a bite out of the charity dollar? 
looking for our piece of the pie. Now, that's not what Jesus taught. We do it all wrong. And the stewardship, the stewardship that Christ taught, is not about setting a financial goal and reaching it. That's fundraising. No. He talked about a lifestyle change. That's what he talked about to that rich young man who came to see him. It's no secret, I'm on the verge of retirement. And I have vowed to keep myself in better physical condition. That's, I am repenting of 40 years of easy living. And honestly, for me, that means losing some weight. My health care plan provides for nutrition counseling. And so I took advantage of it, went to a nutrition counselor. And on the first visit, the question that she asked me was, and she looked right in my eyes, she said, do you want to lose weight or do you want to change how you live? Trick question? I don't think so. It was the right question. You see, losing weight is futile. I needed to change my lifestyle. You know, the stewardship that Jesus taught is similar. It's not about raising funds for the church. It is about developing a healthy lifestyle regarding our finances and our possessions. And if we think we're just raising money to meet a stewardship goal, we're doing it wrong. That's my first point. Second point, stewardship is not about how much we give. Now, what did Jesus teach? When I read the stories of Jesus, I'm struck by two things. First, money, literally money, was his favorite topic. It was, you know, the topic he talked about the most, if we rate them all. Second, when he taught about money and the stewardship of things, he never gave his followers any direction about, about how much to give. That didn't seem to matter to him. Now, we all know the story of the widow who gave two copper coins. She gave the least amount of anybody that morning. And Jesus held her up as an example of good stewardship. And then in the story of the wealthy man, Jesus did not give the man a percentage or an amount to give. No. He told him, sell what he has and give it away. The stewardship that Jesus taught does not center on what we give. Rather, it focuses on what we keep for ourselves. Stewardship is about our lifestyle, and we keep a lot. You know, we worry about the future and whether we're going to have enough. I do. I really do. And so I understand that you do too. So like squirrels gathering nuts before winter, we store stuff because we fear about that we'll need it. We're saving it for that rainy day. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Consider the lilies of the field, birds of the air. God provides for them. Now, stewardship means asking hard questions of our own lives. You know, what do I really need? You know, it's not about how much we give, but rather about how much we keep. It's about how honestly we answer those questions. What do I really need? And what should I keep for me? And when I'm honest with myself, I realize that I, have, that I need a lot less than what I have. I have too many fishing rods, <laughs> too many guitars, too many books, too many of a lot of things. When I'm honest with myself, I realize I need a lot less than what I have. Biblical stewardship of which Jesus taught is a lifestyle. A lifestyle that examines not what we give, but how much we keep for ourselves. And when I think about it like that, I begin to understand, I begin to understand why that young man who came up to Jesus asking about eternal life walked away, dejected. I wonder, would I? I keep seeing myself in his shoes, hearing that answer from the Christ. And I wonder, would I walk away from Christ? How true is the message from the book of Hebrews when it says, the word of God is living, active, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides the soul from the spirit, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I wonder, would I walk away too? Third point, it is a matter of life and death. What was the question that prompted Jesus to tell the young man, go sell what you have and give it to the poor? The question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was responding to a life and death question. Eternal life, the good life, the fulfilling life, is determined by what we keep. Why? Because money, what we keep, often gets in the way of our love for God. It gets in the way of our relationships. It's in the way of helping our fellow human beings. Our possessions are powerful, and they can control our lives. And we begin to live for them. We begin to live to protect them. We begin to deter we use them to, in such a way that they determine our behavior. And so we become workaholics. And consequently, on those days when we're not working, we become playaholics. Where's God in the midst of this? Where's God? Where's the God whom we are called to love with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with our bodies and with our being? You know, is our stuff squeezing God out of our lives? Our possessions and our fealty to them cause us to keep more time for ourselves. I love the moment for mission. Also, it causes us to keep more stuff. So we give less to others, to our families, to the church, to serving those in need, to building up the community, and to enabling people to be reconciled to one another. The question was not how much should I give. No. It was what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus didn't give a doctrinal answer, and this is what I love. He didn't say, you know, if you believe this, and you believe that, and you say this article of faith makes sense, you know, you got it. No. He said, obey the commandments and give. It was all about doing. And the man walked away dejected because he had a lot. And we can assume that he wanted to keep it for himself. And for Christ, it is a matter of life and death. So let me conclude by saying if you love this church, and you want to see it continue its ministry, if you love worshiping here, and if Poland Presbyterian Church is important enough to continue to exist, all of us need to support this stewardship campaign, and we need to be generous. You know, there are unpleasant consequences if we don't. But my prayer is that you will, you will be generous supporting Poland Presbyterian Church, because as imperfect as it is, it does some wonderful and amazing things. A lot of wonderful and amazing things that never make it, you know, that you know, just aren't you know, publicized. And with your new pastor, Paul Anderson, due to be here in five weeks, Poland Presbyterian Church is on the verge of a new era. You know, it's more important than ever. You know, his ministry, I think, needs to take off like a rocket, not die on the launching pad for lack of fuel. Christ invites us to go further in our stewardship lives, to not merely be generous in our giving, but honest about what we need and what we keep for ourselves. Generous support is fundraising. Honesty in what we keep is stewardship. And this is the good news. It's challenging, perhaps upsetting, but good news nonetheless. We have choices. We can join that rich man and walk away. Or we can believe it, follow Christ, give, and live. Amen. <laughs>